thank you for coming. I'm Professor Griffin. I'm one of the mentors for the Boys to Men program, and we're here to talk about Baltimore. Uh, what happened, uh, how it happened, what led to it, and most importantly, we want to talk about what we can do in response to it. Now, Baltimore is not new. Uh, this has happened all over the country at some point or another, whether it's Los Angeles in the 60s, Detroit in the 60s, Washington in the 60s. And so we want to try to have a discussion that is within the context of all that history. Okay? So what we're going to do is, and um, what we're going to do is I'm going to announce our two um, panelists that are here right now. Uh, let me just say beforehand um, that uh, Dr. Um, Denise Graves, uh, Denise Simmons Graves, uh, our colleague, she's actually a resident of Baltimore. She's actually the neighbor to the mayor. Uh, she couldn't be here for, of all reasons, jury duty. <laughs> Nothing conspiratorial in that. I'm just, <laughs> just, just, just the way it came up, okay? All right, but we do have two of our guests here. The other two are en route. They've already contacted me. Um, let me get my, uh, well, let me just go on and announce the guest. Uh, one of our guests is Dr. Wilmer Leon, professor of political science, and talk radio show host. Um, he'll tell you more about his, um, his, uh, what his bio is. And our other guest is Professor Bill Soderberg. He is a, a professor emeritus philosophy, and he is also representing the Peace and Justice Studies community. Also want to thank our very special guest, um, uh, Professor Alonzo Smith, also with Peace and Justice History. And our, uh, we've got uh, Vice President Gwendolyn Dungy. And the rest of you are going to have to hold off because uh, we want to get started. Nothing personal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so what we want to do is first, we're going to give each uh, panelist about a four minute period to just to make an opening statement about what's going on. Uh, let me just go on and say the other guest. The other guest is um, uh, Ms. Darlene Kane, is a resident of Baltimore and the founder of Mothers on the Move. Uh, in 2008, she lost her son uh, in the hands of police, and she started this organization, Mothers on the Move. It's, it's a support group for mothers or fathers uh, who've lost, or anyone who's lost a loved one. Um, to a similar situation. Uh, and Matthew Fogg, he's a chief deputy, U.S. Marshal, retired, co-founder, co-founding member of the National Coalition of Law Enforcement Officers and Justice, uh, for Justice and Reform and Accountability. Uh, he'll be here shortly along with Ms. Kane. Um, so again, first we're going to start out with about a four-minute um, overall statement about the situation. Then we're going to go into questions and um, and uh, we're going to get to questions about you. We're going to ask some specific questions. How many of you, just before we go, how many of you know what LIBOR is? LIBOR. It is the Law Enforcement uh, Bill of Rights. We're going to talk about that in detail as well. On the back of your agenda, you have links that go to some of these things, OK? So without further ado, we'll start with uh, Dr. Leon with his four minutes. Well, thank you, uh, Gus. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This issue in terms of Baltimore is something that I've been uh, writing about, talking about on my show and other shows for quite a while. And I think in, just in terms of some type of summary, I'll put it in, into two major points. One is that what we are experiencing in Baltimore right now, I will say, is very consistent with uh, the laws of physics and that we also have to look at Baltimore in a much, much broader historical context. Uh, one of the few things that I recall from physics class was Newton's third law of motion, that when one body, in this instance the police department, exerts a force on a second body, which we will consider to be the community and particularly the black community, that that second body simultaneously exerts an equal force in magnitude and in opposite direction to the first force. Or as we know it, to every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And so when we look at what's happening in Baltimore with, or Staten Island or uh, Ferguson or even Sacramento, California, uh, we are seeing that second body exert an equal and opposite reaction to the first. The second point being the historical context. One of the, I think, horrific mistakes that is made, whether you're watching CNN or MSNBC, whatever your news outlet, 
is all too often we are looking at these issues as though they occur in a vacuum and as though they're separate incidents. And I realize that the issues in Baltimore may be different in some way and format to, what's, to the issues in Ferguson, which may be different to some of the issues in Staten Island. But I was watching CNN after, uh, during the Ferguson uprising, and I heard somebody say, how could this happen? How did America get to this point? And what that took me to is, this is America. This isn't new. This is what America has always been, even before the country was founded. And I'll just give you a couple of historical points as to why I say that. Um, the first Africans arrived on these shores in 1619. Some will say it was Hampton, some will say it was Jamestown, Virginia, but you're talking about 37 miles, so that debate is understandable. Uh, in 1699, you can go to the Virginia slave statutes, and that's where I have found that we were first, as Africans, determined to be property. Because the debate in Virginia was, does a slave master have the, can the slave master be charged with murder for killing a slave? And the conclusion was no, because no one in their right mind would damage their own property. So 1669 is where I first see that we are determined to be property. Uh, if you look at the Constitution, which was 1787, you've got the Three-Fifths Compromise, you've got the Fugitive Slave Provision, uh, the importation of slaves was allowed till I think 1880 or 1885. Uh, 1857, you've got Dred Scott. Uh, even in the 13th Amendment, slavery was abolished except for punishment for a crime. Uh, then you've got uh, Plessy v. Ferguson. I mean, history is replete with examples of time and time again of Africans and then African Americans being considered less than human. So what I will close with uh, my time, I don't know where I am in time, is by saying this. What we are looking at in Baltimore, Staten Island, Ferguson, again, Sacramento, all over this country, we as African Americans are still struggling to be considered human. And until America comes to grips with that reality, I don't know how we, pro how we progress. Okay. I'm Bill Soderberg, and I'm with the uh, Peace and Justice Studies community here in, uh, in uh, Montgomery College. We have a uh, professor, uh, Adam Schneider, who teaches uh, philosophy in our program as an adjunct. He is unable to be with us today, but uh, Adam, for 20 years, has worked trying to provide health for the homeless in Baltimore. And uh, recently, he uh, sent us a, uh, a rather extended piece that he wrote, and I thought that I would let his voice, uh, I, I, would, I would put my voice in his today with some of the material from his letter that he wrote. But let me give just a little uh, perspective before I do, and that is uh, in the great wisdom that the Chinese study for, uh, have studied for many centuries, uh, known as the Confucian tradition in their school system, there is a discussion about what would bring a country down, what would bring a society down. And Confucius maintains yeah. that a society could do without a military because peoples have been invaded over the centuries and they have somehow survived. They could even do without food because in drought uh, situations they will assist one another. But the one thing that 
cannot coexist with sustainability is mistrust of the leaders. When the people no longer trust the leaders, the society is on its way down. A question that we'll be considering today is whether a riot is the same as an uprising. And I would suggest that uh, this is a wake-up call that's happening again in our country. It's a wake-up call to a potential failure of a social experiment. And what is that experiment? We might think of the banking system, the finance system, as permanent, as going back to time immemorial. But it's a surprise to many people that I've taught over the years that the legalization of interest is about 200 years old. Christianity condemned it until the Industrial Revolution. Islam, in many of its sects, continues to condemn interest. Well, what's wrong with interest? Interest, as these ancient traditions recognize, can divide a society into those who mainly collect interest and those who mainly pay interest. <clears throat> we find in Adam's comments, an undercurrent of people in Baltimore seeking maximum profit from investments and interest. Now, a formulator of the capitalist system, Adam Smith, in the 18th century, put a maximum of 5%. He, that was during that period when interest was being discussed as a legal entity. He said, no more than 5%. We had a talk from the uh, head of the Junior Chamber of Commerce here at the college, and he was asked, and the person who asked the question is right here, Tulin Levitas, a member of our Peace and Justice Studies community. She asked, what is the main philosophy, uh, the main ethics in uh, business in the United States today? And his response was, ethical greed. <laughs> so let's see how this plays out in the mind of somebody who has been involved for two decades at the heart of the social issues in Baltimore. Here is Adam Smith, our colleague, uh, who writes, there seems to be a narrative that assumes that history began on Monday evening when the events in, uh, the recent events in Baltimore began. This narrative would have us believe that the people who are engaged in acts of protest were the ones who destroyed the communities to which they belong. This seems to me a false and dangerous narrative that blames those who are and have been systemically oppressed, marginalized, and excluded. You said that the protesters, he's, he's responding to a person uh, who has disagreed with his position on uh, what's happening in Baltimore and uh, what to do about it. Um, and where it comes from, the root causes of it. And so that's, he says, you said that the protesters destroyed and looted businesses as well as the only pharmacy available to poor neighborhood residents. This ignores the fact that Baltimore City's development policies have destroyed communities and businesses in some areas of the city, for example, Sandtown, while funneling public resources to others, such as Harbor East. Consider the following facts compiled by the group called Housing Our Neighbors. <clears throat> Harbor Point has received $456 million of public funds to support a for-profit development and provide an estimated 14% profit to the investors. Remember Adam Smith? 5%. The city has given upper income housing subsidies $14 million in pilot subsidies compared to $2 million to moderately priced subsidies. Not a penny of the $22.5 million settlement from predatory banking has been budgeted for housing poor city <coughs> residents. Instead, it will tear down 1,500 vacant homes.
in two, uh, this is only intensified by state and federal policies. In 2004, Maryland's Department of Housing and Community Development compiled data for the Governor's Commission on Housing Policy to highlight the shortage of affordable housing for families, seniors, and persons with disabilities by county. Overall, the department projected a need for 120,486 additional units of affordable housing by 2014 to meet the needs of Maryland families, seniors, and people with disabilities with extremely low incomes nearly 50,000 of which are needed for households living under the in, uh, incomes of uh, $8,600 to $13,000 annually. Shamefully, the abundant resources of the wealthiest state in the wealthiest country in the history of the world have not been mobilized for this cause. Governor O'Malley did, however, find resources to expand the state's capacity to incarcerate the children of Sandtown. Now Governor Hogan spends the uh, sends the National Guard and austerity to poor communities of color. The Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, their budgeting authority is roughly 40% of what it was in 1979. This systematic disinvestment in housing for poor people is violence, particularly in the context of massive tax subsidies for affluent homeowners. President Obama's first-time homebuyer tax credit sent $8,000 checks to the affluent, not to the poor. The Bush-Obama Rental Assistance Demonstration Project will privatize a significant portion of Baltimore City's public housing in the next few years, further enriching wealthy private developers. During the Obama recovery, 95% of all newly created wealth went to the top 1%. Ignoring history means that we ignore the violence of present realities. The life expectancy in Sandtown is 20 years shorter than in Roland Park. Why? The median household income is $90,000 less. Half the residents of Sandtown live on less than $25,000 a year, and 37% are officially poor. This is the result of decades of systemic disinvestment and centuries of racial and economic oppression. In other words, I don't see as the most significant problem the fact that rioters destroyed and looted the only pharmacy available to poor neighborhood residents. The problem is that there was only one pharmacy and that the residents are so poor. Perhaps, and here now you get a sense of Adam's uh, uh, tone, perhaps CVS can use insignificant portion of its 2014 profits $4,592,000,000 to rebuild the store and pay a living wage to the employees. The CEO received $31,330,000 in compensation last year so he himself could rebuild the store without any, without any impact on his lifestyle. We should condemn the looting of Baltimore, but when we ignore history, we mistake effect for cause and ignore its real looters those who owned and controlled its engines of production. The steel mills, shipyards, and auto factories have been closed. Workplaces that employed tens of thousands of workers at a living wage were abandoned by the rich for more profitable investments. Now 39% of working age residents are unemployed, and 90% of those who have jobs in, uh, and 90% of those uh, who have jobs work in low paid service jobs. The rich used the people of Baltimore and the resources of the city to generate enormous profits. They looted Baltimore, taking what they wanted and leaving little behind. Under their system, they owe nothing to those who produced billions of dollars of profits and were discarded when they were no longer needed. We ignore the institutions in our midst whose executives are firmly amidst the 1% that refuse to pay employees a living wage and conspire with political elites to underdevelop, then seize and gentrify neighborhoods. We had a Nigerian scholar speak here at the college, and I had an opportunity to ask her uh, uh, about uh, certain uh, things such as the development of cities in, in Africa. And she made the interesting comment that cities are a product of empire. I would add cities are a product of corporate empire. <clears throat> Thank you, Doctor. Um, our um, panel is complete, as you can see now. Our next speaker is going to be Marshall Falk.
Thank you very much, uh, Gus. I appreciate you inviting me here, and certainly my distinguished panel members, I'm glad to be here with you, and certainly you, the distinguished students in this classroom. Um, I'm a retired Chief Deputy United States Marshal. Um, I always wear my retired, this is my, call my retired uniform when I come and speak to classes all around the country, because I want you to get that sort of law enforcement sort of perspective when I speak and what I talk about. Um, we're talking about Baltimore, and we're talking about some of the situations. Baltimore just mirrors what's been going on around the country. I don't have to tell anybody in this room. We've seen Ferguson, New York, all across the, all across the country, Sanford, what recently happened out in California. I've got 32 years of public service. I took on the U.S. Department of Justice as a whistleblower, mm -hmm. re reporting racism and discrimination within the U.S. Department of Justice. Uh, I took them on. And on the job, one of the things on the job, when I got on the job, I always remember, I tell everybody, I said, when I got there, I always remember coming out of the academy as a U.S. Marshal, and I remember all of the training and everything. We had Federal Law Enforcement Training Center in Glencoe, Georgia, and this was like real, like, you know, this is real stuff here, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, we down there learning when to shoot, when not to shoot, when to uh, arrest, how to arrest, search and seizures. Uh, criminal procedures, everything you could learn when it comes down to law enforcement procedures and what we're supposed to do. And I remember when I arrived at my duty station, I always remember what the first thing the, the manager told me. Uh, he said, Fogg, I know you learned a lot of stuff at the academy. It was great stuff that you learned. He said, but this is how we do it here. And at that point forward, I remember it was just like all that stuff I learned at the academy but we had a culture within law enforcement that was a little different. And that culture you hear about often talk, comes down to what we call that blue wall of silence. And I know everybody in this room has kind of heard the blue code, the blue wall of silence. Well, I've become an expert behind the blue wall of silence because I understand how it works. And the bottom line is when you look at Baltimore and you look at the cities around the country, you look at police practices and when we can shoot and when we can't shoot. And, so forth. There is a lot of discretion that is given to law enforcement officers. We have a lot of discretion. And when I decided to take on the Justice Department and file a discrimination lawsuit because of what was happening to me on the inside and some of the stuff that I was being confronted with and some of my colleagues, uh, the racism, the, the, the sort of biased sort of conduct that we were receiving from some of our own law enforcement uh, colleagues, and I always used to say, I said, now, if they're doing this to me, imagine what they're doing to the citizens on the street. So, you know, I mean, you just can't imagine if you got another cop working next to you and he's showing you some racial bias tendencies. So I remember I had to make a decision. I had a lot of people coming to me and they said, well, Fog, you know, uh, look, man, you, you, you've got all of the things going for you, man, as a U.S. Marshal. This is 30-something years ago. I said, Fog, you got all this stuff going for you, man. You tall, man. You know, you, you got the vo voice, you fit the part, man, your voice step away from the vehicle, everything, you know. And so they tell him, they said, man, whatever you do, don't challenge this thing. Don't challenge the system. Go along to get along. You know, you, you've got a duty, man. We want to see you one day become the next head marshal. Then you can make those changes that you see need to be made now. And I used to say, but what if that was my child, or what if that was your son or your daughter? You saw them hit them 10 times when they didn't have to hit them 10 times. When they took them on a joy ride, trust me, I know all about those joy rides in those prisoner vans. I used to call them joy rides. You know, when a prisoner's upset, the prisoner's in pain, hurting, shut up. And they want them to be quiet, and they're not quiet. And they start turning that van and twisting it all around. You can do some serious damage, as, you, as you've seen what happened in Baltimore. Now. There are some people who say, well, did what happened to him, did it occur before he was placed in that van? That's the question that's being asked. Now, I could look at that scenario and I could sit up and tell you, I could say, look, it's possibility that there was some damage to his spine or something to him before he was placed in that van. But he looked like he was able to stand, but his neck, trust me, his, his spine was not severed 80% like it was when he got to the hospital. Or he wouldn't be able to do nothing. He would have been a vet practically a paraplegic, a vegetable. But so what, what happened? And this van made several stops. Now, we used to have this would occur, and I noticed in, in, in the field, like if somebody would do something, especially a manager, and I always tell people, law enforcement is a command and control police paradigm. 
If you want to move up and you want to be right, you do what that commander tells you to do. You know what you know what his motivations are. You understand him, and that's it's like the military. It's a lot like the military command and control environment where you know everybody can be marching up the wrong side of the street. But if somebody raised their hand, why are we marching up the wrong side of the street? You know what happens to them, right? Yeah. Well, it's the same way. The only difference is, well, maybe not the only difference, but we're carrying badges and guns. We got to depend on each other. You know, y'all hear this thing, the good old boy network? The, the, the brotherhood? The band of brothers? No such thing. <laughs> Let me tell you something. It's a band of brothers as long as you go along with the program. How many people saw what happened in New York City? when those police officers up there turned their back on the mayor. You saw that, right? Everybody saw that. I mean, they saw this man. This is their commander-in-chief. These guys turned their back on the commander-in-chief. Now, if they will turn their back on the commander-in-chief, you know what they will do to another police officer, one of their colleagues who decides to tell them, man, what you did was out of order. You shouldn't have done that. You should have done this when that man asked for some help. You should have called for some help. I'm on CNN debating a white New York detective who's saying the chokehold that they used on Eric Gardner was a great takedown. It was a good takedown. And yet we got a coroner's report that said the chokehold is what killed him. And on top of that, it was outlawed by the New York City Police Department. So what we're saying here is, from my perspective, a blue wall of silence expert, what I'm saying is this This sort of uh, corruption, we can call it, takes place on the inside. And what you as citizens happen nowadays that we have technology, we got video cameras. Trust me, how many people think this is just happening now that we got video cameras? We know better than that, right? Okay, so we know this has been going on all along. We got the video. He's sitting right there. The man has been choked out, and then he dies. And if you watch the New York film... You watch even the way the EMTs came up on the scene. They putting their fingers on a man's neck like he's a bear. There's nobody running stethoscopes or putting anything on him, giving him emergency care, you know, checking him, you know, none of that stuff. They just load him up on the cart. And I'm watching this, and I'm on CNN, and I'm saying, look, man, I know how NYPD operates because I done been on many assignments with NYPD. I done been on assignments all over the country being in a dragnet operation. As the U.S. Marshals, we run these dragnet, drug and gun and addiction task forces all over the country. I done worked with Miami PD, New York, Chicago, L.A. I done been everywhere. I see how we do it, and I see how it op- what happens. So what, what I begin to speak out, and even the war on drugs, they would tell us, don't go in the affluent areas. Those white affluent areas, you start going over there, start doing your drug and gun and addiction, throwing flashbangs in those people's houses, running through their homes. You're going to have problems. Stick to the weakest link. Go after those who are least able to defend themselves. You guys probably don't believe that's true. I don't know if you're doing that. But I'm just telling you what goes on. By, and now, when I spoke out against it, somebody started looking at me cross-eyed. Well, Fog, why should you care? It wasn't your son or your daughter that got, got brutalized or got arrested. I mean, look, man, we're getting out. They're still using drugs. They still doing it, and the mentality. I remember one day I'm on WOL radio, and we were talking about a highway where they were speeding down the road, and someone asked a question. Somebody says, well, and we were talking about they were only stopping the black speeders. The guy calls this black guy. He says, he said, Mr. Fogg, he said, were these people speeding? I said, yes, they were. He said, well, what's the problem? What's the problem? And I really had to stop and think for a second because it kind of caught me in the law of God. Then I said, I said, this is what the problem is. I said, we broke the law to enforce the law. I said, we violated the civil rights because we stopped only the black speeders. I said, so we, the whole law was invalid, but what they were doing, they were breaking the law to enforce the law. And he said, oh, like, it, like the bell went off. And this is what we're trying to, this is what we're telling you, ladies and gentlemen, that a lot, what you sing in Baltimore today, that joyride, what happened to that person? I know we got the next panel, so I don't want, because I know you got a lot of questions and so forth. But... When you're talking about the joyride and you're talking about what happened to that gentleman, this is, a, this is a situation where we talk about does black lives matter? Do they really matter? When we look at today and we look at this prison institution and we see 800,000 people out of 2 million people in prison, 800 some thousand are people of color. Come on, what is going on with that? 
And then you're talking about the reasons they were locking people up. I've seen people get locked up for conspiracy stuff that they didn't do zero. It's just that somebody said, we tapping the line, and somebody says to them, uh, look, man, take the stuff over and give it to Joe. I don't want it. I don't want it. Give it to Joe, man. He'll take it. You done just jammed yourself in a conspiracy. You don't even know. Because Joe, go, say, take it away and give it to Joe. Joe buys it. You got problem, And you get more time for conspiracy than you if you had handled the joke. This is the type of laws, the, the draconian laws, crack versus powder cocaine, all of this stuff that was going on in our communities for decades. And nobody was really, they just talk about it a little bit, and that's it. So I'm here to tell you, when I look at that, I brought a couple of little uh, articles here, and then I'm going to let you go. Uh, but just for example, in, in, in Chicago, Illinois, they just admitted to torturing, the torturing of, uh, of, of black suspects over years. And they said, today, Chicago City Council officially passed a landmark legislation that will provide reparations for men and women who were tortured under former Chicago Police Commander John, uh, John Berg, suffocated. Electrocuted, mock execution, all white detectives hurled racist slurs at men they were abusing, and it goes on and on and on. This is not in Afghanistan. This is in the United States of America. You look at, says, former prosecutor says, guns, uh, said, former prosecutor says, cops planted guns on people they shoot. It's standard operational procedure. Did y'all see the man down in South Carolina pick up the taser? just as calmly and laid it there. That tells you how just normal the process is. And I used to say that all, that's one of my codes under the blue wall of silence. Make sure you got a throw down weapon. So if you shoot them or whatever, you throw that little knife or whatever, these are codes under the blue wall of silence. It says off duty black NYPD officers say they are also harassed by white cops. You don't know the numbers of police officers that have come to me from around the country, Fog, I wanna speak out. But I can't, man, because I know what they'll do to me in my career. So what it's going to take is your support. It's going to take students. It's going to take you guys to say, those cops like myself, when I took on the Justice Department and I finally won that case in 1998, they left me on a stakeout right in Baltimore City to die. My white counterparts rolled out on me and left me there. Me, and if it hadn't been for Baltimore City and a couple other state highway and, and a couple of marshals that stayed there with me, I wouldn't be here talking to you today. And the guy's trying to pull a gun out on me, and we didn't kill him. I've been in situations where I could have shot and killed. I didn't. I had one U.S. attorney ask me down in Miami, we fighting this guy. And all through his residence, I never pulled my gun out. He said to me, he said, Mr. Falk, I got one question for you. When you were fighting him, why didn't you just pull your gun out and shoot him? And I said, I guess my life, I didn't feel like my life was in danger. And he said, good answer, good answer. That's the threshold, ladies and gentlemen, is imminent danger. But we got so much discretion in that imminent danger. If I happen to see you as black and I see you as a threat, I'm a, that's just automatic. I'm going to load you up. And that's what happens, and that's what we're seeing over and over. If I got a problem with you, if I don't like you because you're white or black, I can squeeze that round off at you. And pretty much the public is going to back me if you did anything. This is what we've been finding over and over again. So just know that. And uh, I'm, I just, it's just been countless numbers of stories and articles that's been written showing that this blue wall of silence is real. So I'm going to leave it at that, and I'm going to your next uh, panelist. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Darlene Kane, she was the founder of uh, Mothers on the Move. Uh, there is a march this uh, weekend. And, it's, and it's, I'm, I'll let her speak to it more in detail. Ms. Kane. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Thank you again for having me. My name is Darlene Kane. I'm the mother of Dale Graham. Dale Graham was 29 years old when he was shot and killed by a Baltimore City officer. Can you guys hear me? They can't hear me. No, no, no. No, she's good. She's good. She's good. Okay. She's good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. They can't hear you. Oh, okay. Again, my name is Darlene Kane, and thank you again for having me, and thank you for the patience of what I had to do to get here. Thank you guys so much for inviting me. Um, again, on October 28th in 2010, um, there was two officers at my front door after taking my two granddaughters to school, and 
they kept looking at me trying to figure who I was, and I was trying to figure who they were. And they came to me with a driver's license, and what they asked me was, um, who was I to this person? And I told them at that time it was my son. And they said, you have just ID'd him. So IDing him to me was that he was in a hospital. So I asked them what happened to him, where could he be? And that's when they said he was shot. And then I said, well, what hospital is he in? And they were like, he was killed. And I said, well, could you please tell me, you know, who killed him? And that's when they let me know that he was shot by Baltimore City Police and that I was able to pick his body up within four hours. When they told me that, they didn't know who they was talking to because nowhere in the world I was going to pick my child up in four hours without knowing what was going on, what happened, and how come. So because he was from NAACP, an intern, at that time for Kwesi and Fume, I worked at Baltimore City Shock Trauma, Shock Trauma University in Maryland, and I also worked for a volunteer fire department. And I said, well, at least I see my son for myself with my own eyes to know that it's him, for I could believe that it was him and it makes sense. And they wouldn't let me see him. It took me about nine days to fight with the media and um, with the coroner's office so I can go down there and see him. When I did get there, the ID him by the picture they showed me. Had they brought this picture to my home, I would have told him that it was not my child, and I would have went back to sleep. He was disfigured. And that made me say, I've got to do something, but I don't know what. Well, when the time came for me to do his funeral, I was told that I had to go to Vital Records, but I didn't know it was because they weren't able to get an official death certificate. I get to Vital Records, I'm finding out that I am the one telling them that my son passed away. It wasn't recorded in the state of Maryland. So finally, I get the death certificate after going to all these managers, and I have my, have my son's funeral. And I called the lawyer that I had during that time to tell him, you know, to see how the case was going. And he was letting me know that he wasn't able to keep my case. This was one of the best lawyers, not only in the state of Maryland, but has a very good reputation. So when I found out that he couldn't keep my case, I said, well, if you can send me the papers, I promise you that I will do the best I can to solve my own case. I will be his lawyer. I will be everybody and everything that he needs. Well, till this day, I've been able since December of last year to get to the Department of Justice, to make it to the White House to talk to the officials. I've testified in Annapolis in reference to the Bill of Rights in the 10 days that the officers have when they can um, reply to what happened on the scene. And I've been out here fighting ever since. And when I first started, it was just me. I met other people along the way. I met other mothers' um, groups as well. And I decided that instead of me crying for those two years, taking off of work and just using all the tissue, I said I have to do something. And that's when that organization came about. And I started meeting mothers, but I wanted action. I didn't want to keep doing these roundtable interviews and just sitting down, telling all our stories, and then keep saying, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And then when you get to the next meeting, we were still on last week meeting because we never did anything. So I believe in movement, and I am the person that I feel is going to be part of the change because I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep doing what I'm doing. I'm going to be everywhere that you see me. March the 9th, mothers from all over the world. It's an international march. They're coming from Milwaukee, Nebraska. They're coming from... They're coming from all the states from around the world and all over the country, and I will be marching with them as well. And hopefully if you guys can come out and join us, we're starting at Mount Vernon Square, and we are marching to the Department of Justice also. All right. Um, we have flyers. Uh, that we, yeah, don't miss, miss them all down here. We have flyers for the march, tell you everything about it. That's going to be, again, this uh, Saturday. I'm going to pass around a sign-in sheet. If you could please just be sure to, uh, to uh, sign in. Do I have time to add one more thing, guys? Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, another thing that I have done along the way is I created um, a questionnaire for Baltimore City Police Department. I don't have it on me. And what I did is I went community to community um, and asked them to put their zip code on there and their age, and you didn't have to put your nationality. It was optional. And I wrote these questions like, how likely are you to be stopped by a police while walking down the street? 
how likely are you to be stopped while driving your car? Um, and I put things like about sensitivity training. How did you feel about them coming into your neighborhood? Did you feel safer because they're going to be in your neighborhood? And I also gave it to the commissioner, um, Commissioner Bats in Baltimore City. He has it, and it's all over Baltimore City. I was just asked yesterday before I came here, could they have permission to use that for something that they're doing in Baltimore City um, as well. But that's something that I develop as a tool from usually when I speak for people to see how they feel about the police department. And do you feel they may have mental health issues that also needs to be addressed that's not being addressed? So it's a questionnaire is about maybe 13 questions. And um, I'm glad that I used it because it's all over Baltimore City. Um, I have taken it to the Department of Justice. I have taken it to Annapolis and I have given it to the White House officials. So those are some things that I have accomplished along the way. And that's on your website, correct? I haven't put it on my website yet, but I can put it on there for you guys to see. All right, her, her uh, website is on the back, Mother's on the Move. That's on the back sheet of the agenda, all right? As, along with um, Dr. Leon's website, uh, Marshall Fogg's website as well, and Why is Libor. Now, what we're gonna do now is um, actually it's the first question, the primary question that we asked, um, uh, what, what happened in Baltimore, riots or uprisings, uh, I think a lot of that has been answered. Um, but I'm going to primarily put that out and have our panelists give uh, one or two responses if, the, if you don't feel you've already answered that, and then we're going to move on from there, and we're going to get to questions as soon as we can, okay? All right. In, in, in terms of uh, riot versus rebellion or riot versus protest, uh, I think it's important to understand well, I think Dr. King put it put it best. Whenever I throw this out there, it's funny because you know conservatives love to uh, quote Dr. King, usually out of context, uh, when they talk about the color of your skin and the content of your character and his kids and all that stuff. You know, talk about the dream. Well, the dream only makes sense because it's juxtaposed against the horrific nightmare that he was referring to that we continue to exist in today. But Dr. King gave a speech, it was March 14th of 1968, less than 30 days before he was assassinated, uh, called The Two Americas, where he said, uh, I adhere to the uh, program of nonviolence. I subscribe to the militant tactic of nonviolence. But I can't speak to the nonviolence without condemning the conditions that create the outrage in the first place. And then he said, riots are the language of the unheard. And that is something that as a lot of folks doing this analysis and in mainstream media continually want to talk, want to focus on that corner in Baltimore where the CVS was being burned to the ground, riots are the language of the unheard. Anyone, anyone else want to add to that? I think he spoke very well to it. Um, I want to add to it. Um, in reference to the rioting and what was going on in Baltimore City, um, a lot of it is also was a time for people that was already troubled, like youth or maybe some slash adults, they had that opportunity to get out there to lash out as well. And sometimes when people do things like that, it doesn't always go along with the reason of the writing. It's just like their own purpose. And because that people were seeing how many youth were out there doing wrong, throwing rocks, and they were burning up buildings, we have to understand that a lot of these children don't get parents to talk to them every day at home. A lot of these people don't have someone to love them and hug them every day and tell them they love them. And the solution that I feel to some of this is that we need to hear from the angry kids when they're angry. Don't lock them up. Don't incarcerate them all the time. And because they did some things, we can't always give them 10, 15, and 20 years. But we need to listen to them and, and see what they're talking about. Because if we just take a moment, you may can stop a kid from killing someone, killing themselves, harming someone, endangering a, another property. And 
being able to have a second chance with their life. And that's why one of those programs called Second Chance, you know, got passed. Because we all deserve a second chance. And if they are young, how are they going to be able to be reconditioned being in jail? Why not be at home where all the resources are and how we can help? I'm a grandmother, and part of the things that I do is I try to listen. I try to ask, how was your day? And if your day wasn't good, what can we do about this? We need to do some strategy. We need to sit down and talk about this. Let's get the pen and pencil out. And also, I'm a prayer. So I believe in praying. So before we get out here and we label people and we talk bad of them, find out what's going on in their heads, just like the drug dealers on the corner. A lot of these people that's on the corner are out here because that's the only way of thinking they're going to take care of their mother, their grandmother. It's a lot of stories out there. I'm from West Baltimore. I go corner to corner, and I know them all. I know their mothers, their grandmothers, their aunts. I know the little babies they have, and I talk to the girls who have babies every year. You got to be out there, and you got to mentor them. And when you mentor them, you mold them. And as you mold them, they be get the belief, and they can become better people. So just don't give up on them. Don't give up on Baltimore. Don't give up on no other states. Don't give up on anybody. Just be a believer and believe with unity, us coming together, churches, organizations, and all of us coming together, that's going to make the change, and that's going to help us all. Desmond Tutu was an advocate of nonviolence in apartheid in South Africa during that period, and he has responded to uh, the Baltimore uh, situation. Could I uh, very briefly read the paragraph? He says, from friends, I have learned that already due to your courageous presence and unbowed spirit in the streets and halls of power, that you have begun to be heard, and that you have changed the nature of the national conversation about racist police violence, bringing to light the unfortunate pattern that until you stood up had largely been understood as isolated events. But now the nation is debating the deep problems of structural racism and militarized policing tactics. This reframing of the problem is the first step toward true and lasting transformation. And, and just real quick also, some of the police were throwing rocks and bottles back at the people. I don't know if you guys knew that or not. It's true. And that was mentioned on CNN. And I was like horrified because they asked me, I said, wow. And I said, I said, well, now these people don't have shields and helmets and stuff. <laughs> so you throw a rock, rock into that crowd, you're going to really hurt somebody. So it's what I, you know, I always say, I say, violence begets balance. Mm -hmm. It started off with balance, with what they did to this young man, and then it just continued on. So one of the things that, that's always saying, the squeaky wheel gets what? The grease, right? Might be a little, anyway. But, but the bottom line is, I, I, you know, as Dr. Leon said, I, you know, when we looked at what King was saying, we got to look at the whole context of the situation and say, what, what happened in Baltimore? Why were the people in the outrage they were in? At some point, you can't take it anymore, so you react. And that's what I saw in Baltimore. I saw a reaction of what a long-standing problem was that now people want to come to the table and talk about it. Um, just want to go back to the uh, second chance uh, piece that Ms. Kane mentioned. Uh, it's, it's basically a state bill. Uh, it was uh, one among many. It's one of the few that actually got through. And what it does, it basically gives, it reclassifies some uh, prior crimes and or uh, shortens the um, time span for that crime to be a felony. Uh, that way people don't have that scarlet letter across their across their chests, so to speak. Right now, um, uh, the Boys Men program this past year, our, the book we've been reading is called The New Jim Crow, a book that I know many of you have heard of. It's by Michelle Alexander. It's a bestseller. And it talks about the criminal justice system and how essentially, in effect, uh, having a record is the equivalent is the equivalent enslavement of chattel slavery of the past, where you're basically uh, condemned, and it, we're not talking about an absolute analogy. We're talking about a relative analogy to today. All right, and so I strongly encourage you to read that book. And we're going to go on to the um, uh, another question. Uh, again, a lot of you have already answered a lot of these, and so we're going to go to those questions so we can get to your questions. What is Libor. We mentioned Burn, and just, just so you know, on the back of your agenda, you have a link that talks about Libor and why you should care about Libor. It is, I'll just tell you the, um, the acronym, it is the Law Enforcement's uh, Bill of Rights. Um, uh, um, Bill of Rights, okay? So, what is Libor? I'm just going to have the, the panelists uh, chime in on that in a nutshell. 
What is it? Lee Boy is a law enforcement officer's bill of rights. And what it is is pretty much, and what a lot of people don't really understand when you're talking about Lee Boy, is whether or not you have the right to incriminate yourself, uh, whether or not law enforcement officers, it gives law enforcement officers a period of time, and in some states it varies, it gives them a period of time, 10 days maximum, I think, to where the law enforcement officer is involved in something that might bring criminal charges on him to be able to hold his statement and wait before he gives a statement. So pretty much that's, I mean, that, I'm generalizing in a, in a nutshell. That's the piece that you constantly hear about where they say, well, why, does, why can't the officer give a statement right away? Now, um, you are a public servant as a law enforcement officer. I've never believed in Lee Boy. I believe, and, and I've been involved in shootings. I mean, I, like I said, I had the, the officer, I, the, the situation I was telling you, I was in Miami, Actually, my partner ended up shooting the guy. We didn't kill him, and it was an accidental shooting. He was chasing the guy, and when he hit the ground, the shotgun went off, and some of the pellets hit him on the side. No, no vital organs, but the bottom line was we gave statements right away. I didn't waste no time because we, we knew what we were dealing with, and my statement wasn't going to change. The problem with Lee Boy is a lot of times in these investigations, the investigative team that comes in for the police department, that particular law enforcement agency, they'll come in and they'll say, hey, you know, uh, while that 10 days is going on, they'll talk to the officer and they'll tell them, they say, look here, you know, uh, yeah, so-and-so said this happened, and so-and-so said that happened. So that gives that officer a lot of times an opportunity to work on his story, tune it up, fine-tune it, clear it up a little bit, get the, right, get the right story that he wants to tell. So that's the problem of Libor. But again, see, that Libor came under the premise that law enforcement people are the highest integrity. When I say you did something, you're supposed to what? Believe me. Am I right or wrong? Okay. I mean, come on. I mean, that's, that's our judicial system. That when you're a judicial officer for the court and you get up on that stand and you make a statement, your statement is supposed to be <laughs> airtight. It's supposed to be the truth. And I've seen so many situations where officers got up on that stand and I'll never forget, right in D.C., D.C. Superior Court, judge told me, he said, Fog, he said, what that officer said, that drug deal went down? He says, there's no way in the world he could have seen it. He says, tonight, can you and me ride over to that location? I said, sure. We get in the car, we drive over to the location. We look, there's a big old huge building <laughs> in the way where the drug deal, where, where the guy officer was saying he saw the deal. Judge said, he said, I knew this. He said, I knew this guy was lying. He got back to his police officer. He got back in the court. He had monsters. I want to see a supervisor. I'm monitoring it. But yeah, what you don't understand, this goes on because it goes on all the time. So Libor, going back to Libor, it was designed so that pretty much an officer can say, look, I don't want to incriminate myself because if I say I shot for this reason and it turns out that I get indicted, then I don't have to, you know, the Constitution says you don't have to incriminate yourself. You don't have to say anything. The problem is you're a law enforcement officer. So as rules that fall under the procedure of your, of your particular job, you're supposed to give a statement. But again, that statement could turn out to criminalize you, and that's why <coughs> Libor came, that's why they came up really with Libor. Here's a perfect yeah. example, real, real, real-time example. Think about South Carolina. When... I, I'm sorry, I'm not remembering the names. When the brother got shot in South Carolina, the first thing that happened, the chief of police came out, I think it was Sunday or Monday, after the shooting on Saturday, and basically just said, we had a shooting, it was justified, it's all good. Right. Then the video came out. And when the video came out, then the chief of police had to come out and say, uh, well... We got Houston, we got a problem. Mm -hmm. So had it not been for the video, the Libor situation, th this is tangentially related. Right. The cop who did the shooting, his statement all of a sudden had to change. Yep. Because unlike Rodney King, we were able to believe our lying eyes when we looked at that <laughs> video and saw that man get shot eight times, six times in the back. So Libor is a huge, huge problem when yes. it comes to justice. Yes. And that's why we should care about Libor because they shouldn't have 10 days to fix it or try to change it. Because if it was one of us that did something wrong, we got to tell right now. So 
that's one of the reasons why, well, maybe not right, right. away, but they will want us to tell right away because yeah. I'm sitting beside a law enforcement officer, <laughs> retired. <laughs> and also what the public don't know, and you can help me with this one, is that even though they have 10 days to tell their story, they can get an extension on that 10 days. Right, and it's calling on which state you're in, and they got they can't right. verify that bill. But the, the key to it is, is that nobody in this room has a right to incriminate yourself. So, and that's why we always tell people, what the first thing they tell you? Say, don't say nothing. Your lawyers tell you something, like, you know, when you get pulled over, please start asking questions. You don't have to say anything. You can remain silent. Now, we understand. I tell people all the time, cop pull you over, he's, he's king of the road. I don't care what you say. They, they got these rules out where they say, know your rights. Your rights are what I say they are. I mean, bottom line, when you out there on the road, because if I'm the cop and I pull up on you and I got a wild, you know what, going on in my brain or where somewhere else, you know, I'm just saying you, you your mindset is you walk with them and then you see somebody in the car that, hmm, ain't nobody going to care about them anyway. They, they don't matter. And you walk up to them and say, sir, uh, step out of the vehicle. Officer, why do I need to step out of the vehicle? <laughs> You, you, you understand what happens after that. You just so, failed the attitude. You, exactly. You just failed the attitude. So it, it's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of discretion that we have to understand that law enforcement officers have that they've been able to get away with it. And this and is why it's a problem. The public, if you are going on your way to going down to Florida, you drive, you're trying to get to Florida, and you get pulled over by the police, and he says, uh, you mind if I search a car? You really want to say, no, you can't search, but you say, you know if they bring the dog in, y'all know what the dog's nickname is? Alert. He gonna alert anyway. The dog gonna alert on a deodorizer, okay? I'm just telling you, I'm just telling you, you know, when you start talking about probable cause. It's all of the little things that we do that in law enforcement that can get us to where we want to get to and harass you or make you angry enough the way you say something or you say the wrong thing to me. Now I got you out the car sitting on the ground in the mud, in the dirt. Right. All of the things that happens that causes a lot of times that this sort of escalation of the situation that would then never have to get to that level. And that's for design. That's what we because they're told back in the, we're told back in the station, get your numbers up. You got a job, you're a law enforcement officer, you need to be out there locking up some folks. Now we know who to go lock up. I knew all the men, if I stopped the car with four whites in it and car with four blacks in it. I knew whatever I said those black folks did, I knew my supervisor, the, the institution, the lawyer, the DA, the judge, everybody would back me up. Those four white folks, I didn't know who I had in the car. I better cross my T's and dot my I's. That's, that's the culture. We all knew it in the culture. So if you start, everybody starts to operate like that. Imagine that nationwide. Then you start to see the trends of the numbers that you see begin to occur. I think what you speak to, um, Marshall, is that's why, uh, from my perspective, the notion of good cops and bad cops sorely misses the whole point. It misses the whole entire point, okay? Because we're talking about on an institutional and systemic level, okay? To the point where you could replace a whole police department and put a whole new group in. And yeah, there's some are gonna be better than others. That, that's, again, that's, that's beside the point. But as long as you have that culture, you're gonna have much of the same results, okay? And you say, well, what's the difference between that and another uh, work environment? Well, other work environments don't have your freedom or life and death in their hands, all right? And that's a big difference, okay? All right, um, well, one last thing I want to ask before we go to the questions is in my lifetime as I recall um, I think and this is not a defense but I think it, it kind of speaks to the issue on a larger societal level um, police have been deified uh, you know from you know our detective shows and it's pretty much you know good guys bad guys thing and if you grow up with that then it makes sense that you'd have a pretty black and white perspective and I don't I don't I mean that both literally and figuratively the first um, the first media piece the first uh, critical media piece in my lifetime that really examined the other side of police, the, the, the corrupt side, the negative side of peace, police in my lifetime, about 1973, was Serpico. Uh, um, um, and I don't know, I mean, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but Serpico was about 1973. It was um, not De Niro, not De Niro, but um, Al, Pacino. Al Pacino. There you go, my man, Al, Al Pacino, okay? And it was based on a true story, all right? But up until that point, you pretty much only got one image of the police. And subtly or maybe you know directly, that does have an effect on how you think, whether you're conscious of it or not. And so I think that's very important. We're gonna now go to questions. 
If you have a question, just raise your hand. I'm going to bring this mic around to you. You can ask it in any way, shape, or form uh, to our panelists. While, while, you're, while you're doing that, I want to speak to your, to your deified question. point. Because, yes, cops have been deified. But more important to me, and this is, I think, is a big part of the narrative that we have to change. They have been deified while we have been vilified. And it's the vilification element of this that does not give us that extra second of consideration. Getting back to my point of we continue to struggle for our humanity. How many times, I say this on my show all the time, I have never had anybody call me with an answer. When was the last time a white citizen was mistakenly shot by a cop? I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know of Sean Bell. I do know of Amadou Diallo. I do, the list is as long as my arm. And I am saying that it is the historic vilification of black people that has created this perception in the minds of not only police officers, but DAs and everybody else that winds up with our not getting that split second of additional consideration. And let me give you two quick examples that have been long lost in history. Cornell Young Jr. in Providence, Rhode Island, police officer at a restaurant frequented by police officers, sees a situation going on in the parking lot, goes out to address the situation. Gun drawn, badge in hand. He's plain clothes. He's off duty having dinner. Uniforms roll onto the scene. He winds up getting shot. After identifying himself as a cop, he winds up getting shot and killed. And who killed him? A member of his cadet class who didn't even recognize him as a fellow officer. And oh, by the way, his father was the chief of police. Wow. Why, I say, because in that split second, he was not Cornell Young Jr. He was not the son of the chief of police. He was not my cadet classmate. He was a Negro with a gun. Therefore, he must be exterminated. Willie Wilkins Jr plainclothes Oakland cop in pursuit of a drug dealer. Climb, he's chasing this guy through yards through East Oakland. Climbs over a fence, end of his life. Shot by a fellow police officer. We thought he was the perpetrator. I'm still asking the question, when was the last time a white cop was shot in, as a result of mistaken identity, or when was the last time a white citizen was shot because of mistaken identity? I go back to deification versus vilification. Thank you. Very good point. Um, we're going to have questions. If, if you could stand uh, when you ask your question, and just a few things I want you to um, uh, keep in mind. Uh, what I, again, we want you to take something away from this. At least two to three things, and I don't say more because usually when you get to be more, then it's hard to cover. But we want you to take at least two to three things. So start to give some thought to what you've heard, what you're going to hear, and eventually I'm going to pass a sheet of paper around for anybody, anybody who doesn't have one, and uh, we're going to do something where you can record this, and we're going to communicate with you later on down the road. But right now we'll begin the questions. If you would please stand when you ask your question. No. Uh, first of all, I want to thank all of you for this conversation. It was definitely thought-provoking and, uh, and gives us an opportunity to understand the situation better. My question is the following. Do we not to need to have this conversation nationwide? Did everyone hear the question, do we need to have this conversation nationwide? We just did. And then I have a second practical question about the march on Saturday. Where is it happening? What time? Is there a place where we gather? Our men will come as well. Thank you. 
Well, if I don't come up, you don't get in trouble. But anyway. um, <laughs> yes, we do need to have a conversation nationwide. And that's why I'm saying that the narrative has to change. And those of us, myself being a radio talk show host, okay. I'm on uh, uh, a, a number of different programs. I'm calling on those of us that have the mic, those of us in the front of the camera. Uh, we have to start changing this narrative. And we can't sit on CNN and just speak about this as though it's happening in a vacuum. And we can't sit on MSNBC and be afraid to say, this is who America is. <laughs> because in, in my mind, until we start having that conversation, this is not going to change. I think the conversation must go uh, nationwide and perhaps beyond. The uh, discussion in, uh, uh, in the current setting uh, needs to enter into the uh, academic arena, into the uh, colleges. And um, there are now over 100 uh, colleges and universities that have peace and justice studies uh, uh, curricula. Uh, this is a, a very good start uh, to uh, the carrying on of the conversation that has now begun. Did you want to? Oh, yes. Um, to answer to her first question, um, I was just at Morgan State University for the same type of um, form. form. Mm -hmm. And Roland Martin was the host. So um, this is the beginning of some great things that the colleges are doing. Um, one by one, and it should be national for everybody to be heard. The second question that you asked was about the march. Again, it's going to be on Saturday. It starts at 10 a.m. We're all meeting up at Vern Mount, Mer Mount Vernon Square, and we're walking to the Department of Justice. When we leave there, we will have Washington, D.C., and um, once we get to the Department of Justice, we'll be forming up, getting together, um, and we'll be meeting and greeting, and we'll have entertainment set up, and we will have speakers as well. I think I'm one of your speakers. Yeah. Yeah. Great. We're glad to have them. Next question. Yeah, I'm a professor of and I'm an adjunct. I teach history here. And I want to thank you all. <laughs> Good. I'm going to put this in my course in African American history for all the students to really benefit from. But I, I just wanted you all to take away two things uh, in terms of references uh, for African Americans in the justice system. One is the film Slavery by Another Name, which really is a very dramatic portrayal of how African American men caught up in the Southern justice system, but also how they were economically, systematically, right. That's right. economically exploited. And it really uh, shows how often when they just needed labor, they would find infractions of the law, you know, minor infractions, and put men away for extended, often Anything. Of time. Anything. So it's really shocking. So, yeah. you know, that book should be read, Slavery by Another Name by Douglas Blackman. Right. You should read that before you read Michelle Alexander. That's right, you should, because what that really deals with is the period after the it, For historical context, yeah. you should for read that context. before you read Michelle's book. Because Michelle uh, Alexander's book focuses on a contemporary situation. This book goes back about 100, 125, 130 years. Now, the other thing is a book that has come out uh, by a gentleman named Khalil Gibran Muhammad. Khalil Gibran Muhammad is currently the director of the Shopper Center for African American History in New York City. And his book is called The Criminalization of Blackness. Uh, the Criminalization of Blackness is based on uh, records from most primarily from the city of Philadelphia, also New York. And what he does is he looks at a lot of the police files and uh, the social service agencies and the court files. And he really demonstrates and documents case after case after case how poor black men differently from white immigrants. 
uh, and you know, the socio sociology, the field of sociology was just beginning to, uh, and I'll just try to speed this up because I know that a lot of you have some really valid things. But basically, he shows how sociologists had a different academic explanation for white criminality and for black criminality. And the uh, white crime criminals were kind of poor, disadvantaged, uh, uneducated people, whereas the black criminals somehow were kind of these dangerous, frightening creatures in the city let loose suddenly you know, out of control, you know. Uh, <laughs> and it really shows you how people who were college educated sociologists, supposedly educated people, had this totally racist view and how that translated into police treatment and court treatment and social work treatment and school teacher treatment and the whole, si so this is a systemic, it's not just a problem with police, it's a problem with the system of whom certain police officers are reflecting. But you know, Thank actually you. I like to make a little comment about what you just said, sir. I, you know, I tell you, when I got in law enforcement and I started actually seeing it with my own eyes, and I thank God because I was able to work on a lot of varied assignments that most of these police experts that you see on television now and talking about, they haven't had the experience that I've had as far as with the dragging out operations, uh, you know, being on the SWAT team, went out to LAPD, took a SWAT team out there, backed up LAPD for the riots, uh, the Rodney King riots. The, the, I could just go on an Atlanta penitentiary takeover. A lot of experience that I had with a lot of different law enforcement departments. And I saw one sort of common thread. And, and when, I, when I say this, people get a little concerned. I say, you know what? I've come to the reality that it is, it's, it's, about, it's about race and slavery just being transferred right into the, right into the current daytime. People say, well, you know, I'm writing a book, Bigots with Badges. Y'all get ready. I'm just trying to think of my byline. And my byline was going to be from Bull Run to Gettysburg, but they surrendered at Gettysburg. But then I started thinking, I said, you know what? Maybe your byline needs to be a facade of justice or an illusion of justice. Bigots with badges and then an illusion. Because it really is. I mean, all, all of our work, everything that we do centers around, and we all understand that in the culture. It centers around race. Like I said, when, when, if we had had an equal opportunity enforcement operation in the war on drugs, they would have ended it the same way they did alcohol prohibition. Long time ago, they would have said, you're not putting my son in jail for no 5, 10, 15 years and messing their life up because they made a mistake and they smoked some marijuana or sold some. Absolutely not. That's right. And when I began to see that and I started speaking out against it, I was speaking out against it. Bigots with badges. The New York Post did a story on me. Covered the whole Sunday morning front page edition, me and my white partner. They did a story on us in 1997 saying bigots with badges. So we was talking about it back then. And I'm trying to get people and the radios and everybody to get involved and say, we need to do something about this now. And everybody was like, well, yeah, but it's just a few bad apples. Okay. Well, now let's see what those few bad apples are today. They done spoiled the whole lot. And so that's what we're seeing today. So it, no, this is the this is a real serious race issue that yes, President is. Obama has to address. I know he wants to kind of he's done something, but he wants to kind of go around it. But he's got to be straight about this. This is all about race, and this is the second slavery. And I always, you know, what I say, I, I, this one chief of police he was talking about when he got rid of drug dealers out of Seattle. He was all excited. He said, you know. He said, we went in, we cleaned up this little town, we got rid of all the drugs. He said, we was all excited about it. He said, and then the Miami boys moved in with clubs and automatic weapons and everything else. He said, we wanted our old drug boys back. You know, and what it says to me is that if we don't really address the root problem that created the Civil War, where brother and sister went against each other, killing each other, all because they wanted people of color to be property, because they wanted black, they wanted to keep their property, when they went to war, killing each other, that shows you how deeply rooted this thing is. And so even if we get rid of the war on drugs, or even if we fix this little problem we got, will something else pop up that still keeps this sort of slavery trend going in America where black versus white is always going to be there? And that's the thing that we really got to look at. And here's, and here's the thing. 
you used a word which I am imploring all of us to rebel against. The word is race. Race does not exist. It is an artificial construct. It was created for two major things. To allow those so-called Christians who settled this country to rationalize in their own minds how they could dehumanize, there is that word again, a group of people who look different than them. We are going to create a subcategory of humans who we can then rationalize as subjugating. And it was also created because as those slaves and poor whites started to form unity, they had to figure out a way, how do we prevent these poor whites from hooking up with these slaves and these newly freed blacks? We will, we will convince these poor whites that they are better than these Negroes, they are superior by the color of their skin. Race is an artificial construct, and we have to start the conversation. And that's why I say this is America, because America, that the term, if you go back and read European history, the word race doesn't even exist. It, it doesn't come into the lexicon until after this continent was settled by Europeans. When we talk about uh, slavery by another name, it's uh, very enlightening to go and uh, examine our belief whether slavery was abolished. And we can find in the 13th Amendment that it is allowed. Slavery uh, in its overt form was allowed, but for those who have been duly convicted of a crime, it is not applicable in the 13th Amendment of our Constitution. Okay. All right, um, Patrick. Next question. I'm coming here. Uh, just, I'm going to start passing some things around uh, for those who don't have it. Um, what we're going to do is, I'd like you to write down. If you already have some paper, that's fine. But I'd like you to write down one, two, maybe three things that you're going to take away from this. All right. It might be you're going to read a book. Okay. It might be you're going to read one of the books that have been recommended. That might be one of them. Another one might be, and I would hope that this is the one I would hope everyone would take with you, join an organization. Join an organization that is geared towards addressing some of the issues we've talked about. Now, no one organization can be all things to all people. Okay. Uh, the organization might be directly about addressing issues in the criminal justice system. Another one might be uh, addressing uh, education issues. Okay. One thing that unnerves me to no end is this notion that black folks don't deal with this. Well, what about black on black crime? Well, two, two distinctions that need to be made. First of all, when black people kill other black people, it's a good chance they're going to go to jail. All right. And the second one is the notion that we don't address black on black crime. It sort of uh, dismisses where most of us as college graduates are in, end up studying. Usually it's some type of social science areas. That's where the majority of us major in because the notion is to try to stop the avalanche at the top of the hill as opposed to at the bottom of the hill. All right. So does that make sense? All right. That, that's a large reason why I'm in education. And I'm sure a lot of us others are. OK. So just keep that in mind as a way to sort of respond uh, when you're going to hear that. And the notion that there's black on black crime, which is not a small matter at all, doesn't mean that this issue shouldn't be addressed at all. Okay. So what I'm going to do is pass this around. Again, write down two or three things that you're going to take away from this. I'm going to pass around envelopes. Self-address the envelope. Now let me just say this again, because I know some of you have never written letters. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. I did not your fault. All right. Let me just <laughs> you write your address up here. You write your address in the middle. See, I even forgot. Your address in the middle. All right. And we're going to stamp it up here. We're going to seal it, and in 30 to 45 days, we're going to send you this letter as a reminder of what you said you would do. All right? Everybody understand that? So I'm going to start passing this around. Patrick, your question. Stand up, please. I mean, there's more of a statement than anything. I want to um, just address, I want to say thank you to all of y'all um, for coming here today, and I appreciate this. Um, Baltimore really hit close to home for me because um, I'm a victim of police brutality, you know. Not bad. <laughs> I mean, I'm good. So, and I just want to thank you for that. And um, yeah, you guys are right that you know we have to make a change and you know step forward, and that's what we all trying to do. You know, I was judged based off. I'm still judged based off my parents, and I'm a college educated student now, and I'm still educating myself. But um, it just goes to show you that. 
it doesn't really matter what you do and how you look because you're still going to be judged based off your appearance by your skin color. You know, every I walk out on the street every day and I still feel for my life by, um, you know, walking next to a police officer. So no disrespect to you. I saw the gentleman and, you know, I, I said, okay, I have to sit up now because, you know, he's in there. He's going to look at me funny and, you know, automatically judge me. And that's just how it is. I also, I'm from New York City, so that we have a um, implemented um, kiss and frisk, and that's it. Just doesn't make sense to me. Why do you feel like that's um, a way to justify um, peace by by just um, I can't really I don't know the word for it, but you basically trying to control a society by kissing and frisking them just because of the color, their skin color or how they look and how they're acting versus, you know, somebody else. Why is that something that you guys implemented just in this specific area versus everywhere else? You know, man, uh, New York, I'm going to tell you, and I've worked with police bombs all, and I know they don't, they don't like that when I said, but I, I call, excuse me, but I call a spade a spade. And I, I, you know, all the places I've worked around the country, one of the most sort of problems that sort of had sort of one of the most sort of vigilante sort of responses to especially in your Queens and in certain areas in the Bronx and Harlem responses when we would go up there and we looking for fugitives and stuff these guys would jump out. I never get one day we had a particular particular picture of a guy black guy and the cop the the the, the supervisor called me and said Frog where you guys at I said we're so he said come on over I think we got I think we got your subject located so we shot over on the scene. They got about 15 black dudes all prone down on the ground. They are hot. They are mad. They're upset. Man, why y'all doing it? I mean, they just going through. You know, it was a powder keg waiting to happen. So I said, I walked over. I said, man, come in. Let me talk to you for a minute. I said, how are these guys on? He said, well, we just didn't know which one of them it was. Mm. That, you know, that's just the mentality. So they just prone them all out. Because we all look alike. Yeah, we all look alike. And that's what I said. I said, so I said, excuse me, so you saying we all look alike? He said, well, I'm just trying to eat it because he was caught off guard because he's used to the other officers going along with the program, but I didn't. I said, man, get all these guys up. I said, this is what caused us to have problems. One of these guys had to turn around and resist it, then y'all would have shot him or done something to him. So what I'm saying to you is that, yes, but the problem that we got in this paradigm of policing, we got black cops, and I tell people, this is like being on the plantation. You either gonna work in the field or you're gonna work in the big house. Wow. And everybody wants to work in the big house. And y'all know, if y'all read up on some of the roots and stuff, where you if you had to work somewhere, probably where you want to work, because that field was hard work. And so working your way around to that big house, and what this master would often do is he would make the overseer what? A black person. And he'd give him that whip and he would hit you harder with that whip than the white overseer would, because he knew if he didn't. He wasn't hard on you. That master would look at him and say, I'm going to put you out in the field and put one of them over you. Let me tell you, that's a heck of a thing. And I would see that, and that was the same thing they used in the plea bargaining scenario. They take a young man, they say, look here, you, I want you to say he gave you the drugs. Mm -hmm. Well, I want you to say he told you to do it. So, man, he didn't tell me that. If you don't do it, we're going to give you 10 years. We're going to get the project. We're going to give you 10 years. You know how many guys have pointed a young man out that didn't do anything because they wanted to get him look y'all this is the real this is some real stuff here and i'm glad we're having the conversation i'm glad we're talking about it because i've been saying it all along there are a lot of these young men that are in prison whose lives have been completely ruined charged with a felony you take a black man you charge him with a felony he can't even pick up a broom now because the foreigners are picking those up so all he can do is go somewhere and try to survive try to survive i tell people a lot of this stuff is about survival you can say what you want you know remember y'all remember katrina when the white folks was was taking the stuff they said they were surviving what they say about the black folks they were what looting. they were looting this is what america is about and we need to change the paradigm we need to change the way we think with this and y'all need to back up law enforcement officers like myself and others who are blowing the whistle, I'm like, that's the first line of defense. We need to let law enforcement officers know, instead of a bill of rights, you know what you need? A whistleblower protection law. So that those law officers who want to come forward and say, Fog, I want to do what you did, but I got a family I got to feed. And I don't want to go tell, I know they hit this dude, to the, I know they planted the drugs, I know it's happening all the time. But they know they can come forward, 
we got a witness protection program. Y'all heard U.S. Mars and witness protection program, right? We got a program. We put you in that program. Now, that's for mafia and all of that. It ain't for police. It's for mafia. And when the mafia, most of these guys that we put in the program, they dirt bags themselves. They came from a dirt bag world. And they get in our program. Now, we got to protect them. Gotta, I mean, I used to be, I got to protect this dude. He, all the people in the killed and messed up because he's turning federal evidence against the others. But we need that for police officers. So these are one of the solutions. Write that down. Police officers that are willing to come forward, we need your help. Whistleblower, y'all look me up. Y'all, I'm on, you Google me. But we're going to be looking for all kinds of reformation when it comes down to what we can really, how we can really make police officers be real community police. Thank you. The, the well, I want to add. That you use, look, at the, look at the news coverage when Kentucky lost the basketball game. And the riot that broke out right. on the wow. University of Kentucky campus. All these white kids burning stuff, turning over police cars, burning up the campus. Oh, they were just letting off steam. But Baltimore and Ferguson, oh, they riot. They riot. Right. Right. They're out of control. Right. It's, it's perception, and I keep going back to the word narrative, because how we control that narrative impacts people's perception how the story gets told, and if you tell the story right, you're, if you ask the right questions or tell the right story, the answers are going to be different. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question, and, and just by the way, I was pretty mad when they lost to it. messed up my bracket, but I mean, I, I, didn't, do, I didn't do any of that stuff, though. I'm going to pass my card around, by the way. You just pass it. Just pass. Um, I wanted to start off briefly with a statement. I mean, I have a question. It's just the this... Remember how you were mentioning this word race? I think another word that we need to focus on is this word thug that's been pa being passed around. You know, this, uh, this, this, this word that is taking our humanity, so to speak. And Geraldo Rivera had been on TV a while ago, I think it was a few days ago, and he pointed out a white person and said, that's a white thug. Okay, so if that's a white thug, like, why, why, why did you just have to add that white part to that? Okay, so implicit in that word is the fact that thug is a racialized term for black people to justify their subjugation. So, and I, and I think the thing is, is that when the rioting was being covered, um, this idea like, the, you know, people, you know, supporters, people who wanted to support the protesters came up and said things like, oh, well, if we would just give them a better education, then they would be better off. And, 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 and I don't think that that was the, I don't think that was the problem. I mean, for, I mean, I think the issue was is when they were peaceful nobody listened or there was just not a lot of media coverage and then all of these people all of a sudden when they want to riot when they are, are uprising as either or anybody as anybody wants to call it then suddenly they care Na then then suddenly then then suddenly it's it's a national issue that we need to talk about so i think the question is how do we hold the media especially accountable for ignoring for ignoring us as a community when we try to be peaceful okay because to me that to me that says when 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 we when we ride and they get angry why can't you just die quietly you know that's that's what that tells me you know why can't you just protest in a way that we can just all safely ignore you you know that's what that tells me Okay, so how do we hold them accountable for that? Excellent question. <clears throat> that's always been that. That's always been uh, the question of the ages: is how do we take control of the system that is control, trying to control us? And the media is part of that system. And it just like what uh, again I talk about CNN, MSNBC, all these news stations. We watch it, we see it on our radio stations, we see how they present stuff, and people are concerned. If they say the wrong thing, then they ostracize you. If you get up there and you, you say something that, that is the truth, but it, it, it doesn't like, it's not like being heard, want to be heard. Like, remember when Obama was running for president, and Reverend, was it Rice? Rice. Right? Jeremiah Rice. Right. Yeah, Jeremiah Rice. Right. And remember, he, they just kept playing it over and over again, they, the content. God damn, America, they just kept... They took it all out of context of what he was saying about the history of America. And you look at the history of America, you would say, you would say, 
Who would do what, what America's history did? But they took it out of context. So what I'm saying to you is, but instead of people rallying around, everybody was like, oh, well, he needs to get out of that church. He needs to change. Or he needs to do this. The reality is, yes, the news controls. Those big stations control. And how do we as people come together and make sure our message is heard? Can I just say one sure. thing? Sure. Um, the other thing to that is, what message do we send to America when... We've got six officers being charged after the riot, okay? That tells America, that that, t that tells the black community, oh, well, you know, uh, rioting gets things done. You know, okay. being peaceful <laughs> does not work, okay? Mm -hmm. And they tried being peaceful. They tried. We tried for years, and people don't want to listen. And you're right. And look, you know what? As I said earlier, what? The squeaky wheel, what? Gets the grease. I mean, the bottom line is, the bottom line is, no, nobody advocates. We're not sitting there advocating violence. But I will say, the squeaky wheel gets the grip. When people are laying out there in the street and we let them, we let the traffic go by and all that stuff, that's when you started hearing people do something. So, yeah, you are right. If, and trust me, had nobody in Baltimore done anything, it would just be everybody saying that's just another black man that was killed at the hands of the police and maybe he ran for a reason. Okay. Um, the only thing that I, the thing I was just saying was, what America is telling the black community is that um, rioting gets things done because of the fact that um, after the riots, the uh, six officers were finally charged, and I think that's a problem. Uh, I'm just going to add um, one thing on on uh, something we could do in terms of media. I think. Um, Part of the issue is, we gotta keep in mind, uh, the majority of our media is corporate. The majority of our media is profit driven. I think we can vary our media consumption. That can be a part of the solution. All right, um, uh, go to some public TV. Uh, the internet has done a great thing in terms of they don't have the media, they don't have a monopoly on the media. And that's a genie that's out of the bottle and they can't put it back in. So we can get our news in different venues now. And I think if we go to different venues and once those, those the viewership drops, those sponsorship dollars drop, that's going to have an impact, impact okay? But, but understand, too, the media doesn't give a damn about you. How many of y'all ever knew someone with a Nielsen box in their house? There you go. Because <laughs> they don't care about you. And so, I mean, there's a reason I'm no longer on MSNBC. There's a reason I'm no oh. longer on CNN. Because this I... delivery and this context is not the delivery and context that you're looking for. And that's frankly, right. Negative. that's the primary reason why I didn't stay in media. If I do, this is what I would have to do. Or at least the things that you've been seeing, this is what I would have to do to stay in media. And I knew that at the beginning. So, you want to answer me, I think you'll say about covering it. Is it? Okay. Next question. Just, and we have about maybe five minutes before we have to start wrapping up. I just wanted to thank Professor Griffin and the panel for uh, speaking about this topic. But one thing that Professor Griffin said was we need to come away with something today. The problems that the panel, all due respect, spoke about shouldn't be a surprise to anyone in the room. The different way we are not acting or acting or behaving as a people is the problem that's been the problem, is going to continue to be the problem. This is systematic. We're not going to answer this today. But there is one person on the panel that has a unique perspective that's directly related to Baltimore City. And we call it Baltimore City. This, is, this isn't a Baltimore City problem. This is the last stop. So the, the, it's not the last stop. I'm sorry about that. It's, it's, it's the most recent stop. And so the one thing I want to hear from is the officer of color on the panel. And the reason I say that is because you've been a young black man. And you've been um, profiled. And you've been stopped. And then you came into the police department and you put your foot down. And then you fought for uh, the wrongs that were happening to you. What do we tell? the youth of today to take away from today. This is something we can leave the room with today. What's your perspective or advice on how if you leave today and you're pulled over, something you can tell them that may save them today? Because the systematic problem isn't a today thing. The fact that we uh, imprison persons, call it rehabilitation, when they get out, they're not allowed to vote, they're not allowed to have a job, and we call it a rehabilitation for what? 
because they don't, there's, there's no societal expectation after that because you're just going to be a criminal. Yeah, criminal we, we no longer you know. call it rehabilitation. It is now, it is now strict incarceration. And we, got away, we got away from the rehabilitation model around 1978, 79 is when that started to shift. You know what, uh, it was, crazy as this sounds, I got locked up when I was 18 years old and arrested, charged with robbery and thrown in jail. And that was, that was a rude awakening for me. I was the witness in the case. Myself and another employee were the witnesses. And this white detective just got our names twisted up downtown on the report and just, oh, let's just go lock up these two Negroes. And they came to the house with shotguns and right in Washington, D.C. So carried me out of the house in handcuffs and everything. I was terrified. I had never been locked up. Then they took me and put me in a central cell block. And he came and got me on a weekend because when he realized he made the mistake, instead of just letting me go, he just backed away from me. He wanted me to say I did it. He said, well, if you say you did it, then I can let you out right away. Because he wanted to cover himself. I was so upset. I, and then they put me in a cell with a guy, a six by eight cell. No, it wasn't Bubba. Everybody, first thing everybody thinks it's a Bubba. No, it was not Bubba. It was probably worse than Bubba. No, look, they put me in a cell with a guy who was kicking, who was going through heroin withdrawals mm -hmm. in a six by eight cell. He was crying, hollering, rolling all over the floor, puking, throwing up. I'm in the top rack in the corner. Guards! You know what I thought? I thought he was becoming a werewolf. I didn't know anything about no. I knew nothing about <laughs> drug withdrawals. I knew from, about werewolves. I knew about werewolves. <laughs> I, went, I went from one time he was asleep on the floor, face down. I said he's going to sit up and he's going to have all of his face. And he's going to tear me from limb to limb. But let me tell you something. Then on top of that, then he take us to a big bullpen and he put us all in cell. All these lawyers talking this, and then he put this little this woman in the cell with us. She was had some little tights on, little red top. Walk around a little ponytail, real demure and everything, just just laid back. And I asked Dusty, man, why they put a girl in here with us? He said, man, ain't no girl, that's a dude. <laughs> no. I'm just telling you my experiences. That was just that little bit of time. I went through all of that, and then when they found it, they said, okay, you're free to go. And let me tell you, when they let me go, I was so mad, I went back to that detective. He said, well, man, he said, the boy first said you did it, then he changed his mind. I said, man, that's right. But you know what that did to me? That changed my world because it stopped me from, later on when I got my degree out of college and I was trying to get in law for all the stuff that we deal with, I ended up, it stopped me from becoming a D.C. Metro Transit Police Officer because they went and they looked at my background and they said, you've been locked up for robbery. I said, I didn't do it. Guys said, hey, Paul, we can't hire you. Put things aside. I, American Civil Liberties Union took the case, expunged my whole record. All that's going to be in my book because I go from start to finish like what you were saying, sir. But the bottom line is this. What I will tell you is this. Once I got into law enforcement and did, the Lord showed me everything that I went through, I'm going to be doing. Locking people up, people walking to me. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I was willing to believe you. And I got in a big incident for trying to believe a guy <laughs> didn't do it. But the bottom line is this. I would tell you when you get pulled over by the police, mm -hmm. Listen, you can't, there's really not a whole lot you can do, but just do what the officer tells you. All you can do is just say, officer, which, look, when they get behind me, the hair stands up on the back of my neck. Because I don't know what they're going to do. I really don't. He might say, well, the man had a gun. I just fired him up. So all I do is just, officer, you know, boom. All I can tell you is just go along with the officer. Now, if he says, do I want to search your car? He said, officer, I don't want you to search my car. Unless you don't mind him search your car. Unless you don't mind. But then the key is you don't know if you're going to plant something or throw something at. See, this, and I, it hates, I, it pains me to say this because you don't know which office is which. And somebody says, well, Paul, if it's a few bad apples, I said, be in a stadium full of 100,000 people. And let them come over to the PA system and say, look, y'all, everybody in here is good people, but we got two bad cops in here. We don't know what they're going to do. Sure. Everybody's gonna go home. Am I right or wrong? I don't know. Everybody's gonna leave. Okay. <laughs> I'm just telling you because you when you're talking about terrorism, a bad cop is a terrorist. He's wow. a terrorist. Now, y'all, that's what we need to start first saying. Those six terrorists, we gotta start calling people what they are. Because he's got a badge, he's got the means, he's got the werewolf, he has the way of taking you out. So you have to understand that. So that's what I'm saying, you know.
Well, you also said he was a young black man. I, I was too. Once, I know you can't tell that, but once upon a time I was. Uh, a quick point to because I also have, I have a 13 year old son, all right? And I have to deal with him and his friends and this whole conversation. Right. And I said this on my show about comply and comply and do what you're told to do, put your hands on the wheel, all that kind of stuff. And a caller asked me, but you can still get shot. That's true. That's true. And I said, you know what? You're absolutely right. There's no guarantee here. Mm. And you mm -hmm. can comply till the cows come home and still <laughs> wind up getting shot. Yep. This isn't about, unfortunately, the reality is this is not about not getting shot. All this really is about is putting the odds in your favor. Wow. That's really what this, unfortunately, that's what this comes down to. This is about, because I, I tell my students and I tell my son, the win in the game is to leave the circumstance in the same condition that you entered the circumstance. I have never met a guy. I hear a whole lot of people talk about, I'd have kicked that cop's butt. I have never <laughs> met a black man that has won a fight with a cop. <laughs> now, the cemetery are, is full of brothers that have tried. <laughs> but I have never met that one guy and that's serious. that has won the fight with the cop in the street. The win is you fight him in court. There you go. That's where you win the fight. You win the fight in court. But it's really all about odds and probability. Mm -hmm. and, and you know what? Just real quick, just to add to that, went real fast. I know. A black marshal, y'all remember about, about till he just got out of prison. I support him the whole time. A black marshal out here in Rockville in 2004, a, a white guy, young white guy, thinks the marshal hit his car. The young white guy had six long Allen iced teas in him, and he didn't have a driver's license. And he was a neighbor. He was in the neighbor. Just got in the neighbor. He was up here on injury, getting checked out. He thought the marshal hit his car because he had all that alcohol in him. He chases the marshal, and the marshal got his whole family in the car off duty. Arthur Lloyd. I just talked to Lloyd this morning. I support him. All the other marshals. Everybody got scared. I stayed with him ten years, man. Prison, man, prison. Do you know now? How, this is what happened to him. The, the white guy rides up to him, jumps out of his car, and, and the marshal got his whole wife and five new. Got his new wife and three kid, three new kids and one and her two, five kids in the car. And he says, he comes out, he says, man, he shows back. The, the guy is cussing. You hit my car, you hit my car. He says, son, calm down. He says, calm down. He says, I hit your car. Show me what you're talking about. And you put your hand on his shoulder. Show me. And the guy hauls off and bam, hits the marshal in the face, knocks him to the ground, starts kicking him, breaks the marshal's hand. Marshal pulls his gun out. Now, what did he do? He shot low. We are told to shoot body mass. We ain't supposed to be shooting arms and limbs. He shoots, and I know we got time is fine. He shoots low, boom. Y'all want me to finish the story? Should I? I want to hit. All right, look. He shoots low, pow. Shoots a guy named, guy falls down. I don't believe he shot me. I don't believe he shot me. He said, the marshal got his badge on. U.S. marshal, you're under arrest. You don't go nowhere. Guy says, I want to see more. I want to see you. Open your eyes. He said, this is all you're going to see. He's telling the guy that. Then the guy dials. He said, I'm going to call the police. The guy actually dials 911. Now everything is being recorded. The marshal said, don't you get up. You stay right there. The guy gets up. All of our training is, I'm trying to place you on the rest. Do I let you go get in the car? <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> no. not. He's letting the guy walk to the car. White guy probably shot him quick. Okay, but I'm just saying, he let him go to his car. Boom, he goes to the car. He's, and he's telling him, if you get in that car, I will shoot you. I will shoot you. All this is being recorded. The guy goes and gets in his car. Right behind his family's car, the marshal's family car, the kids are on the car, they all freaking out. He's standing over the guy, driver's side, standing over him. If you start that car, I will shoot you. He's telling the guy, all that's on video, on, 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 on voicemail. The guy says, hey, gets the guy. first he rummages around in the car. All that came out. Then he throws the car, and gets rubber, and he cuts out the marshal in the direction of the marshal. Marshal, marshal, marshal just back in, kapow, fires a shot. Shot goes in on the backside, goes down through the aorta, kills him. All on the news here. I mean, I'm surprised. It was right out here in Montgomery, Rockville, right out here at Toys R Us. He had his family. It was right at Halloween. He was taking his kids. To the, you know what they did? Now, this marshal was like me. He had won a discrimination lawsuit against the U.S. Marshal Service. He had stood up to him. 
they put him in jail immediately. No, no 10 day labor, no, no nothing. And the unions didn't come this aid. Mothers against drunk drivers didn't come this aid. The white guy had six Long Island iced teas in him, saw the march, and then they put him in jail. Then the attorney that he ends up getting sells him down the drain. They handle a, they do a, a trial where they say it was self defense. Instead of trying him like a marshal, only because he's told the police he shot low, and because they didn't want to get into a thing that we're not supposed to be shooting low, we should. So the bottom line, make a long story short, they ended up convicting that. First, he stayed in jail, didn't get no bond, no bond. And this remember, this is a black man marshal shooting a white person. See how the difference was in the law. He not only did he not only did he get finally in the end, the jury say we want to know, Your Honor. Was Arthur Lloyd, was he, was he a marshal? Just says, nope. He tried, it's a self-defense case, therefore he was just like Joe Blow's citizen. He had to retreat. The ju jury came back, convicted him, they charged him, and they gave him uh, uh, 12, 10 to, uh, 12 to 15 years. He did mm. 10 years, he just got out. And, and I stayed with him the whole time. But I'm just telling you, this is the system that we're dealing with. It's, that's why I say it's about, I say this is about race when I use that term race. I talk about it. it, whether you want to say black, if you want to call it black versus white, we can say that. But the bottom line is, that is so clear cut to me that I got to a point where I said, Matthew, you can't see it no other way. Everything you, everything, it's like W over B equals R. The theory of relativity for racism. It's, I mean, it's there. It's like, what else do you do? Okay, we have a last question. I grew up in um, Columbia Heights uh, with a bunch of, a lot of different people. One guy became president of the National Urban League. Another guy became commander of the Pacific North Atlantic Fleet, the North Atlantic uh, U.S. Naval Fleet. But I remember when I was walking to Howard as a student, a lot of the guys that I knew were standing outside the liquor store. And, I, you know, a lot of them ended up in Morton. What I tell the young men in my class is that when you get stopped by a police officer, it doesn't matter whether he's black or white, you're a black man up against the justice system. Be very, very careful how you act, what you say, and what you do. Because this officer has a gun. He has a gun. That's the bottom line. And he can kill you in any moment. And so, but you're not alone. You have your family, you have your <coughs> You have your community, you have your mother, and that's why you're in school, because of those people. So live. Because there's a lot of people behind you. Thank you. Um, uh, just the last uh, piece I'd, I'd say, there was a, a comedian, I think it was Michael Collier, and he uh, address that question and he said the one thing I think that is important and again all we're doing is hedging our bets so to speak there's, there's no guarantee but I think one thing is very important is try to identify something you have in common with that officer and the one thing you have in common with that officer is that you both want to get home that evening okay I think that can help to some degree all right um, and we hope it helps to some degree okay I know we can go on forever, folks. I thank you all for coming. I'd like you to give our panelists a big round of applause.